um, through his porcelain vessel, his museum installation, his books, and Mundeval explored the questions of inheritance and loss, the Jewish diaspora, restitution, memories. And later this year, when possible, hopefully, as soon as this sanitary crisis is over, and Moon de Val will display new works uh, at the Muse Musée Nissim de Camondo in Paris, being the first living artist uh, to be invited to exhibit uh, in this museum. So welcome, Edmond. Both books you have noticed, one are a more conventionally scholarly study, the other a set of imaginary letters, explore in different ways the glory and horrors of European history also the powerful stories of French Jewish art collectors. And I put together French and Jewish art collector together. And both of you, you use object art collection, and both of you, you go through extensive archival research to explore this rich and complicated part of uh, French history. So my first question to both of you is, why did you, as you are both non-French, embark on this project? James. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you um, uh, all at Albertine and, and you, Charlotte, and Edmund especially. Um, your book, The Hair with Amber Eyes, was a real inspiration for me, and I know um, just sort of a, a cult classic um, among my friends and family, so um, uh, it's, it's really a, an honor. Um, and uh, I very much appreciate the question. Um, you know, I think I think two uh, two things. On the on the one hand, you know, from a purely um, academic perspective, um, you know, I I was always fascinated by um, the the history of the Jews in France, and it's such a rich history because it was, of course, in France that the Jews were emancipated before anywhere else in Western Europe during the French Revolution, 1790, 1791, and um, the entire um, conception that emerges in the French Revolution about um, universal citizenship and what it means to be a citizen of this new uh, republic that was devised, and also the place of um, uh, minority communities and particular experiences within that republic is, you know, a, a very theoretical and profound um, uh, conversation and debate for, you know, political theory and just sort of social cohesion everywhere. But in France at that time, the role of the Jewish community was this sort of actual story against which that very theoretical discussion was played out. And so that's the sort of the, 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 the I think the, the genesis of this project for me. And then, um, you know, this is a top Area that has any number of scholarly studies on it. I mean, the Dreyfus Affair and Vichy, it's extremely well-trodden territory. And so I thought to myself, you know, what could I do that would be a contribution? Like, what, what is there to add? Um, and um, I'll never forget when I was, uh, um, I think I was maybe a junior in college, I worked as a sort of coffee garçon in the offices of the International Herald Tribune, the now defunct um, Herald Tribune, which is now the New York Times. Um, and I lived that summer with um, a very dear professor, Patrice Igonet, to whom my book is dedicated. And we were talking about all of these things. And one night at dinner, he said, you know, you might visit the Musée Nissim de Camondo. And, um, you know, once I did that, I became completely uh, mesmerized by the place. And then just through the years, um, I visited any number of other similar museums. And it occurred to me that these were all bequests um, left to the French state by people of a very similar background and experience. So, and it turns out that they're all intermarried as well. So it was a world. So you have the Musée Nissim de Camondo, you have the Chateau de champs sur marne outside Paris, which was the Quai d'Anvers property, uh, the Camondo and the Quai d'Anvers intermarried. You have the Reinach House in the south of France and the Villa Efrussi de Rothschild across the bay. And it's this whole social world um, and it just struck me that there was something going on very important with these bequests and the use of the collections to, on the one hand, um, I think, celebrate um, uh, French cultural patrimony, but also, and I, I, I argue this in the book, um, writing Jews into that national story in subtle ways. And so that's 
um, how I got into the topic and that's the contribution that I hope to make. Thank you, Jen. And Edmund, why these letters to Kamando? Why letters? Why, why Kamando? Well, first of all, I'd like to reiterate how thrilled I am to be in this company. And, and, and Jane's, you know, um, friends and, and, and Jane's, your book is a, it's absolutely astonishing and remarkable book. Um, and uh, for me, um, it, 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 there were many things that I, I did not know. <laughs> And uh, it's a passionate and scholarly book and passion and scholarship should always, in my opinion, come together uh, if they can be so effective. So why, why, why have I written this? It's because it's unfinished business. It's because um, almost 20 years ago when I started to um, research the hair with amber eyes, I was in the Rue de Monceau. I was haunting, haunting Paris as much as I was trying to work out where I was in Vienna and Odessa, I was trying to work out where my diasporic family lived um, and, and what traces there were of my family. And so I was in the Rue de Monceau a lot. And that meant I was down from my family house uh, where the Afrusi family, my own Jewish family lived, um, it, the Musée Nissim de Camondo, and, and that was part of my journey. So I grew to love it and be perplexed by it as this um, astonishing uh, house, which is, uh, acts as a memorial created by uh, Comte Moïse de Camondo for his lost son and for his father. So it acts as a, as a memorial, but has this um, powerful supplementary action of being a memorial, an unintentional memorial for, for uh, Beatrice Camondo um, and her husband, Leon Reinach, and their two children who are uh, who are murdered in Auschwitz. So it has this double effect of being a memorial intended and an unintended memorial. And because I work with memory, because I am, that's what my practice is about, writing about it and making things, how could I not be obsessed by that house? And so it is unfinished business. And that's why I started to write letters. That's why I started to write letters, Tim, because I wanted something personal. I wanted to, I wanted to talk to him um, about things that mattered to me. I wanted to be um, um, amused and cross and interested and intrigued and ask him real questions about things that mattered to me, mattered to me and I felt mattered to him. And of course, he doesn't write back. I was going to ask, did he, did he probably did it somehow. Did you learn things by his way of on your own family? Maybe it is, was his answers to your, to your letters. What did you, how did he push further the air with them behind and your knowledge and understanding of your own story and who you are? And it's a, a, a neighboring book to The Hair with Amber Eyes because it's, it's actually about, um, it's really a, a questioning of what books and literature can do. You know, um, can you can you create a memorial in, in words that is effective and has some resonance? It's so interesting for me because, of course, J James um, um, navigates brilliant, brilliantly this whole issue. And I, you've already mentioned it, James. We have to almost start there with gift giving, with this idea of, of bequests, of trying. It's so fascinating, isn't it, James? Trying to um, um, leave a mark in the country uh, which you now know but you belong to, to France. So all these Jewish families are trying to um, become more French than the French, uh, and they're trying to influence the, the future history of their families within France. It's all about gift giving, it's fascinating. It's about trying to create a memorial for your family in the future. Isn't it? I, I'm, I'm looking at you, James. I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, solicit. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, I, um, I'm, I'm struck by uh, one particular thing I found in the archives, which was, um, so basically like all of the uh, museums and estates in both of our books are left to the state. It's important to say in the 20s and 30s. So, uh, you know, we might, from the perspective of hindsight, look at this and see it in a certain light because we know how the story ended in a way that they did not. Uh, and by they, I mean the 
um, the, the, the philanthropists and collectors who left their houses and their collections to the state. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it, they're sort of on the one hand frozen in this pre-war time and then they, ha as Edmund said, they have these sort of double um, uh, functions given what happened after the story, which is a different issue. But just to speak about uh, the way the collectors understood these bequests, um, you know, I'm struck by one thing in particular, which is, um, so champs sur marne the, the Candonvert family house left by Charles Candonvert to the state in the mid thirties. When he, um, when he did so, he wrote a kind of um, brief pamphlet um, that was a, you know, short introduction to the history of the house and what it meant. And it is this just kind of amazing tableau of French history, a microcosm of the halcyon days of the Ancien Regime, you know, the house, it, 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 um, it saw the likes of Voltaire and, and Chateaubriand come to dinner and all of these kind of illustrious personalities. And it ends with the um, arrival of his parents, Louis and Louise Candonvert, who loyally restored the house with the architect Destayer to its um, 18th century glory. And from the way that he writes, the, the, the implication is clear, which is that this is a sort of, you know, long durée narrative of France and its evolution through the centuries. And now my family, the Cayenne d'Anvers family, are as loyal custodians of that past as are every other uh, family and character in the story. So it's a way of of writing Jews into the French national, the, the, the so-called roman national or national novel, I think. Um, and more or less, I think the same is true for the other collections in this set. Certainly so with the Musée Camondo, um, which Edmund, you know, you, you mentioned already, it's, it's donated in honor of Moise's fallen son who died fighting for France in the First World War. So there is this attempt to, um, you know, I think weave these families into the national patrimony, but also to contribute and shape the, the, the national patrimony as well. I mean, these are superb collections of 18th century objets d'art um, that you would appreciate if you knew nothing about the families and if you were just, say, somebody interested in the, um, the aesthetics of it. So I, I, I think absolutely. But I was always really struck by that sort of um, subtle ulterior motive. Um, anyway. But is there, is, there were a lot of collectors at the time, especially in Paris. Uh, yeah. Many collected 18th century work of art. Uh, so why signaling out, if you want, the, the Jewish collector? Why is it important to, yeah. or, or not, to, 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 to deal or treat them in books the way you do separately uh, than the other collector? What this object meant for, for them differently than to other collectors? That is, um, oh, who, who, should, uh, who should go first? Go for it, James. I, I've got oh. my own strong opinions on this. So okay, I'm, yeah, I, 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 I do as well. Um, yeah. you, um, that's such an interesting question that you pose, and it is indeed one that I got so often as I was doing the research for this book. You know, a lot of archivists that I encountered would ask me in that, that, that way, you know, why single out these, these Jewish families in this way? Um, as, as you just said, Charlotte, there were many others who collected the same period at the same time. Aren't you, um, in singling out these Jewish collectors, in some way replicating the way they were seen by their oppressors in the, in the time? Which is, of course, a very French uh, um, interpretation of this. You know, France is a country in which the recognition of difference even for you know, kind of academic purposes, is not always sort of smiled upon um, in service of the sort of universalist vision of society, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, the my my I feel very strongly about that. And the answer is, well, um, this is a milieu that did not have the same fate as other collectors, right? I mean, um, why is it that Beatrice de Camondo, that Julian and Leon Reinach, that you know the uh, the, the Cayenne d'Anvers sisters? All of them are hunted down and deported and in many cases murdered in Auschwitz. Well, that's because, I mean, however they thought of themselves and there was a lot of um, diversity in terms of their Jewish identities and their relationship to Judaism and Jewishness. I mean, they were um, uh, in many cases uh, murdered because they were Jews at the end of their lives or and their families, I should say. Not all the collectors were still alive at the time of the war. So. Um, that's a very, um, I, I think, a very valid reason 
um, and, and a very important one. And, if, and to, deny, um, to deny them of that um, analysis uh, posthumously is in some way to, um, to insult them and also to, um, to move on from what happened in a way, to sort of efface and elide the horrors of the Second World War, which we cannot do. And so that's, that's my uh, feeling about that. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. And I, I, you know, and I, there's a line in my book where I say, I, 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 I get so angry when I'm told to move on, you know, that we, you should move on from this stuff. Actually, no, it's, it's, there's a powerful reason for, for returning simply because this is not thought through. This is not sorted out. This is not finished business um, in the sense that actually uh, there is a huge amount of, of, of um, denial uh, and I use that word very, very deliberately in France, in French society, about what happens um, um, to the Jewish population. Of France. Absolutely, uh, it's, it's extraordinary to me, having worked in 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 complicated bits of Europe, um, France and Aus uh, um, Austria and, and and Germany in particular, uh, to find um, uh, just how. Um, how extraordinarily um, under the surface this still is. So why, why, why do you want to take this seriously? Because as I write in my book, my family, your family, these families are written off as arabistes, parvenus, nouveaux riches, profiteers, social climbers, vulgarians, upstarts, status, status seekers, and mimics. They're always being decried for their taste, their, the visibility of what they are trying to do by making their families live well in France with French possessions. So that visibility of them oh. as collectors, it's all about them not being properly French, not be, being allowed to be French, and in some ways um, um, taking the patrimony of France, uh, which should not be theirs. So in that sense, you know, that whole thing about who decides that you're French or not? That central question, which runs through the last century, who decides who belongs in the country um, um, and who is impure and not a, a human being and not a, a citizen of that country, seems to me to be uh, encapsulated in this group of four families my own Pat's the fifth in Paris in that in that particular milieu which you write about so well, John. So that's when I talk about unfinished business. It bloody is. Yeah, and if if I may add um, just one thing based on what Edmund just said, um, and Charlotte, this this sort of returns to your question about not just grouping these particular characters together in a single study, but what did the objects um, like? What what did the objects and the collections mean for them? that might not have been the case for um, non-Jewish collectors in the time. And Edmund, um, you, you, you just mentioned something I think it's, it's very important that we should talk about a little more, which is that in the fin de siècle, the period that we both write about, um, I mean, first of all, the, the level of anti-Semitism was unbelievably vitriolic and inescapable and omnipresent. I mean, this was the time of the Dreyfus Affair. This was the time of any number of other um, uh, sort of financial yeah. scandals yeah. that elicited like the Panama scandal, the Alfasa affair, um, the crash of the Union Générale, the big bank that the Rothschilds had partially funded. And every single one of those um, incidents was a giant um, sort of public affair that saw each of these families dragged through the mud by name and constantly. So that's the backdrop. But, 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 but a very, very important thing I think that we have to take into account is the, um, the degree to which anti-Semitism in that period was aesthetic in nature and expressed in the language of art and material things. And I think Edmund's absolutely right um, in, in pointing that out. And so like the, the, the likes of Edouard Drummond, for instance, the, the great, um, I mean, he certainly wasn't great. I mean, great in the most sort of well-known, um, the, the, the most famous or infamous um, anti-Semite in modern European, uh, uh, modern French history, um, his critique in La France Juive, the, um, the, the famous screed that, by the way, made the fortune of the Parisian publishing house, La Marion, which is still on the market today, um, it's all about attacking these families for owning objects that he did not think they deserved to own. It is 
it is attacking them because they have purchased homes that he believes do not belong to them because they are these foreign interlopers. It's a it's a it's a line of argument that's based on the the fear of invasion and of kind of wrought from within by these kind of material marauders, so to speak. So um, there's also the level. Um, in that critique in which, um, and Edmund, I think you, you started to say this, that you, you use the word mimetic. That's absolutely right. People like Drummond and the likes of Jules and Edmond Goncourt, also horrible anti-Semites in the period, um, they, they argued that Jews could not know and understand true beauty and were always, um, well, mimetic, aesthetically, to use your word, and, and somehow, um, uh, um, somehow incapable of of creating or understanding art. And so I think that for these families, the collections were even more important because they were rejoinders to that critique on some level. They were attempts to show that, yes, we can indeed understand true beauty and here it is. And I think that that's a very powerful um, element of it as well. And, and so, so what, so, sorry, Charlotte. <laughs> so, just, so, so, so was it so necessary um, and, and in your book, and I try and do it in my own, is to look for the agency that these family ha families have. These aren't victims, <laughs> you know, they aren't, they aren't families who are, they end up maybe in concentration camps, but you, you look for the agency that these families have to try and create, to, to, to create who they want to be in the world. And that's why it's so important um, to concentrate uh, amongst other things about this extraordinary, the Reinach family. Um, um, who have a, uh, and the brothers uh, Reinach, who, um, who are in some ways the, the, the family that needs um, more attention and more visibility. I, I'm sure I'm you will so agree. Yeah. Um, um, and, and part of these extraordinary trio of brothers um, at the end of the 19th century through into the, into the, into the uh, 1920s have a kind of uh, an, intellectual, an intellectual passion but trying to uh, make an argument, particularly Theodore, Theodore Arena, that actually um, uh, that Judaism and, and France um, are natural uh, travelers together on a, on a similar road. And there's a way of making a contemporary Judaism in France, which will be a beacon to the rest of the world. It's an extraordinary vision of Jewish life, um, um, which is very powerful to read even now, you know, almost a hundred years later. Um, so looking for the agency in these families is really important. I agree. And I think as a French person, and I lived uh, 20 years abroad in the United States and I'm back now in, in France. And I, I do look at this culture completely differently. And I think you're absolutely right uh, by everything you, you just said. And also, James, you, you, you explain very beautifully in your book something that I actually was not completely fully aware also, it is this absolutely anti-Semitize, we say anti-Semitism uh, in during the, the Third uh, Republic. I mean, it was, it was the Second World War didn't come up like that. It was like many, many years of, of this raise, uh, this raising uh, force of hate um, against, against Jew. And so if at the time the French art community museum director, gallerist, a lot of dealers were Jew, uh, could not do anything to protect, to defend uh, the value and the importance of these collections. Uh, what can we do today? What do you think, how, how do you do write books? You, Edmond, you will do an, an exhibit works at, at the Musée Nissim de Camando, which I know you work well, and I, I know that it will move and it will raise the, the, the right question to French um, uh, uh, people. But what else can do you think we, we could have done or we could do still today? I think that's a very good question. I mean, I think, um, first of all, I should say that the Musée Nissim de Camando is uh, incredible on this front. I mean, um, uh, like, the, the current director and, and staff, they are superb and they have done so much to bring the family into the experience of visiting the museum, which I think is crucial. I mean, and, and, and it's also in line with how Moise de Camondo imagined the space from the beginning. You know, there, were, there was always a sort of um, element of the family's private apartments meant to be seen, not perhaps as much as there is today, but you know, that was always 
part of the equation. But so the, the Chemondo Museum, I mean, that, that's very, very well done, I would say. But then, you know, in other cases, it's not. Um, some of these other spaces, um, like some of the, the, the other collections, which you can visit, I should say, um, for those of you who have not 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 been there. Um, almost all of the um, collections in both Edmonds and my books are open to the public and you can see them. And when you do, you will see that not all of them really tell you that much about the collector and where they come from. Um, and that I think is where we could where we could vastly improve. Um, for instance, you know, at at um, at Carilos in the south of France, the great Rhinoc house, there is a sort of small plaque. Um, but mostly it's a tour of this incredibly bizarre and beautiful Greek villa, or um, Greek-inspired villa, I should say. And um, I just think that there could be much, much more um, uh, resuscitation of the family stories in those spaces, putting the people back in the place, so to speak. And, you know, on, and on the subject of the Rhinox, I mean, this to me is just, it's, it's one of the the most frustrating experiences I had in the, the research of the book. And I, I mean, I, I could not agree more with Edmund. I mean, for me, the Rhinox are the most inspiring of the characters in this whole world. They were largely, I mean, they, they were essentially the William Henry and Alice James of the Third Republic. I mean, no one was more at the center of cultural, political, and public life. I mean, these guys were museum directors, they were members of the French parliament, they were academics, they were, you name it, they did everything. And, and by the way, also, I mean, as Edmund mentioned, great sort of theorists of Franco-Judaism and public defenders of Alfred Dreyfus. They were at the center of all of this. Um, and yet, and yet, um, they have essentially vanished, except in footnotes about in, in stories about other people, which is just mystifying to me. And um, in Saint Germain en Laye, outside Paris, um, the leafy suburb where the family was sort of based, there used to be um, a plaque outside the Rhinoc house that I saw when I was a PhD student just beginning this years ago. And then, sort of in finishing the book this past year, I learned that the plaque had been taken down in I think maybe 2017 or so for a renovation. And you know, just in fact checking, I, um, I spoke to the mairie and uh, asked about that. And they said that there are no plans to put it back up. I mean, how can that be? I mean, honestly, I mean, that's, um, that's quite jarring omission. And I, I think that just more of that, of bringing these people back to life in some way um, would be the, a, a step in the right direction we could do immediately. You're, it's exactly that, isn't it? It's 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 a really powerful act. It's a, an act actually of restitution. It's going back into history and restituting names, and families, and stories, and places. You know, and I think that is absolutely the first act of trying to understand history in a it, the, the 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 febrile and, and fissile nature of history. That it, you have to go back carefully like you have done James and, 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 and it, it's an archival principle too which is one that I, I hold dear to myself and so for me you know I, I walk down the Rue de Monceau and I can name all the Jewish families that lived in all the houses but I can also name all the houses that were taken over in 1940 and 1941 uh, where uh, particular members of the SS lived where the Milice uh, were headquartered uh, where there was a torture chain on the Rue de Monsa. So, you know, you have to re-inhabit history uh, uh, with the families and with the, 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 the really difficult and dark moments. And to return, Charlotte, to your original question, um, yes, um, um, you have to go back to these particular places and, and bring that, that sense of, of the texture of family life back in. Uh, the, the Museum of Sendek, Kamondo does, does it beautifully, and, and Kerolos is a disgrace, in fact, to be honest, because you could go there and be completely mystified by that extraordinary building. You could be completely mystified by it. Oh, I agree. Because there is these places that are museum and are frozen in time in many ways. And, and James, you, you chose to study these houses that a uh, frozen moment of memory where, and Camondo is probably the most exceptional example of all. Um, and I love, Edmund, when you talk about dust in your book, um, yeah. there is this, this moment of like, yeah, this, the silence uh, 
the clock have stopped, you know, running. There is, but there is also all of the other ones, and that is the heir. It's the other families, the one who have lost everything, actually. Mm-hmm. And, and these also need to be, and that is going through restitution, you're right, uh, returning, telling the stories. And, and I'm, I'm being stuck about the way that I think your book in France, the letter, the, uh, the Camondo has been translated. I think it will be powerful. Your exhibition at, at the Musée Camondo will be also very important. You, have, you are going to talk to a totally different audience. I, I know you know, <laughs> and 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 James, I, I hope that many many French people will read your book, um, and because it's very an important part of this history that they need to know and 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 we need to deal with. Well, well, one of the things, James, that I found so powerful, <laughs> and it was something that I found hugely emotionally draining when I when I did my own research, and then I discovered. I mean, because your research is so extraordinary is where you talk about the the three um camps in in not Drancy the 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 appalling camp on the edges of Paris guarded as we know by French policemen uh, which is the deportation camp uh, um for Auschwitz yes but the three other camps Bassano, Levitin and I can't remember the other one um, where 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 the the all the possessions that that's that are stripped from ordinary Jewish families and neighborhoods are, are taken, you know, shoes and sewing machines uh, and crockets and, and China. And, 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 and there are photographs um, um, of, of, of huge rooms just stacked uh, with the material goods taken from dispossessed uh, uh, um, Parisians mm. who happen to be Jewish. And it, it's you can walk down the Rue Bassano um, past that extraordinary house where um, Irene uh, Candover was, was born, and you would not know that that was actually a concentration camp. Mm-hmm. That was actually a place which was a clearing house for all the, all the possessions of, 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 of Jewish families. So come on, you know, there you are, there's a great big bloody lacuna in contemporary memory within the center of Paris. I agree. And, um, you know, in a way, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I am also concerned by a new trend or a new turn, so to speak, in the historiography in France on this period. And that is, um, I mean, I, it, it's, there was a new book published uh, maybe 10 years ago now, or uh, maybe a little more recently than that, um, called, you know, Survival, How 75% of the French Jews Survived the Second World War. And, you know, yes, that is true factually. I mean, in terms of numbers, right? Yes, fewer um, uh, French Jews were murdered than were, you know, than, for instance, in the Netherlands, where the numbers were much, much higher. And yet, um, you know, I, I find this whole... Um, the, 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 the momentum behind the book, even if that is a factual observation you can make to be deeply troubling because what it has done is essentially, um, you know, give uh, the time of day to the notion that, um, well, you know, suffering was worse elsewhere and that many of these people are not actually victims. And I just, um, I, I find that just really, I mean, appalling that that, that that is sort of so well regarded and um, and seemingly so prevalent everywhere you go and with people you talk to because you know since when is um, is first of all I mean sir, uh, I don't I, I do not think that this should be a numbers game and um, by the way survival could also be rupture I mean you know why is it that so many of these families uh, the survivors do not live in France anymore. Well, I mean, it seems pretty clear to me and to anybody who would read any of the things that they left behind. Um, and that, that, that really did bother me a lot, um, sort of where things are in the field at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, sorry, no, sorry. yes. I, no, say something if you want, Edmund. I, well, I'm just agreeing. I'm just agreeing profoundly with you. We sadly agree. But to, <laughs> to go back, I, I want to, to, because we're going to, take a few questions from a very large public uh, around the world uh, in a few minutes. But I, I think what it's amazing through your books is, is you bring back to life amazing people. 
And I started by saying, were they more Jewish, more Jew, more French? They came, which identity they saw themselves, how they are remembered today? I think it's a very important question. And, uh, and to celebrate uh, them, they are fascinating, extremely highly cultivated. They are brought together the best collection. Uh, and, and that is also what you discover when you read your book. And, 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 and the world that's, that by its richness is just probably would never exist again. I mean, it was really a very, very high moment of, of French culture. And so a um, light question to finish, my last question will be, in this amazing, incredible set of character, which one is your favorite? Which one you would like to have dinner? I know you said that you love the Reinhardt family, but for many reasons you explained, but which one is the one that, you know, you would like to have a dinner tonight? Not to write letters to, Edmond, you already did it, but uh, to, to have a conversation with and what you would ask, would you would like to know about that specific character? Who are you asking, Charlotte? Who's Both of you. you? I start with Jane. Oh, um, hmm. I think I would choose Theodore Reinach. I mean, he, to me, is just the most um, completely fascinating character in the, in the mix. Um, I mean, as I mentioned before, a true polymath who was, you know, a politician, um, a scholar, a collector, and also this great sort of theorist of... Franco Judaism and numismatist and just uh, classicist and everything. And so I would love to um, have had the chance to, to talk with him. A drink with him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I don't think I would do much talking. I would just sort of listen, but it would be great. I mean, this is the ridiculousness of history. This, my grandmother, aged 21, when she left Vienna, went and lived in Paris and lived with the, in Theodore Reinach's house. So this is where history kind of collapses you know, um, on us. So who would I want to, you know, and me too. I mean, I want, to, I, I, if I can gate crash your dinner party, James, I'll, I'll, I'll be there. Of but, course. Damn it, if we're talking about dinner, if we're going to talk about dinner, there's only one person out there, which is the Comte de Camondo in the Musée, Nissim de Camondo, who had the best cook in Paris. And um, my God, one of and the- And the best <laughs> service, the self service. Exactly. So, yes. so I, I would be sitting in a porcelain room surrounded by a, an extraordinary Sèvres porcelain service, which has uh, all the birds taken from Buffon. Come on, how cool is that? And then uh, we will have, um, well, I mean, one of the problems about working in archives is you find menus. And so, um, you know, um, here is an, a nine course a meal that he gave on the 22nd of May 1935 and my god that's the meal I would like to have tonight with him and you know what I'm sure he was a good conversa conversationalist I actually um, um you know I, I want to talk to him about what it is to collect stuff what it is to actually try and put together rooms um, um, so beautifully in that sort of musical way that he does uh, uh, and, and what it is um, to try and think about family, families and collections. I really, really desperately want to ask him that over an unbelievably good meal. So I have a, an, uh, actually another question. Um, do you think they did it consciously, the collecting? Did they consciously collect 18th century objects because of the strong um, association with a, I moment of French history of uh, enlightenment of, of, of that, that past French history. Do you think they, they chose and they knew or it was also following trends and, and or both or? Uh, who, who are you asking? Which we, oh, we should... We're both nodding. One, you both okay. Both okay. Okay. <laughs> however, however. Um, I think absolutely consciously. Um, I also think, you know, it's complicated, right? I mean, collections are many things. You know, they are on the one hand, uh, people collect, um, especially elites, um, collect what is in style in a certain moment. And it was true that in the fin du siècle, there was this rediscovery of the Ancien Regime, which had a certain kind of political connotation associated with it. It was, it was what you did if you were in this sort of social milieu, Jewish or not. Um, there, there, there's that aspect of it. 
But, you know, collections are more than that. You know, it's, it's, um, it's both social and psychological. You know, collections are any number of things. I mean, there's a wonderful essay that I think we both quote um, by Walter Benjamin about, you know, what, what a collection is. And it's, you know, on the one hand, it's, um, it's about stopping dispersion, as Benjamin puts it. It's about, it's about um, control. I mean, you know, um, and, and for these families, I think that's very much part of it. You know, th these were sanctuaries that they could absolutely order and control in the way that they could never control what was happening in the outside world in their lives where they had so much hostility. But then, you know, th there's also just, um, Benjamin also says the, that the collection is a magic circle in which the collector feels safe and secure and delighted. And with every individual collector, you know, there's there's some kind of uh, personal element there that, that isn't necessarily legible on some larger matrix about culture and identity. And I don't know. I mean, I, I think that's why collections are so rich as, as um, historical sources and texts, if you will, because they tell us so much um, in ways that even things that people write and leave behind do not. And so um, I think there's so much there. So I, I, I absolutely concur. Um, we, could, we could concur for hours, but I absolutely concur. But you know what? There is Drummond, and there are there's anti-Semitic press talking about veneer and saying that, 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 that these families don't understand uh, the real weight of things. And then I go into in, in around the Musée Camondo, and it's full of things which are beautifully embellished and veneered. And I say to him, I think you just love veneer. I think you loved 18th century things because they are the ep epitome of civility and conversation between materials, between craftsmen and artists, uh, you know, it's the, uh, uh, and ac across disciplines, which of course is what the French Enlightenment is. It's that extraordinary reach across disciplines. So why wouldn't you want to have beautiful 18th century furniture in your house full of veneer, uh, you know, and sod drumont? in the streets of Paris, you know, absolutely. You understand what it is to have those kinds of things of beauty around you. That's my final point. Can we take a few questions from uh, uh, Sandrine, maybe from people around the world who wants to talk to James or Edmund? Okay, one first question of Mr. or Mrs. Polecek, I don't know. Uh, who is it? Did these families collect Judaica? If yes, can you give us some examples on where they are found now? Yes, um, that is a very um, important question. And the answer to that is yes. Um, it very much differs family to family what the answer to that question is. But for instance, um, uh, in the case of the Camondo, for instance, and I know that Edmund and I both write about this, um, they did have a fairly significant collection of Judaica that they brought with them from Constantinople to France when they arrived in the 1860s. And when um, his parents die and Moise de Camondo inherits the whole, um, uh, and not just uh, Moise, but also his cousin, uh, when they inherit the houses on the Rue de Monceau, which are right next to each other, um, at that point, they essentially got rid of the Judaica, um, and they gave a lot of it to the Rue Buffo synagogue, the Sephardic synagogue in Paris, and also to the Musée de Cluny um, in the fifth, where also the Rothschilds gave a lot of Judaica as well. So it really depends, and I think it's difficult to, um, to read into what the relationship to Jewish objects tells us about their relationship to Jewish identity. That's something I thought a lot about and I just, I'm not sure that there is um, a clear answer because you know, they're, they're, not, um, they're not getting rid of it. They're not throwing it away. Um, you know, the Camondo gave it to the museum and you know, it, would have, it would have had their name and it was, it, it did have their name in the catalog. It was meant to be seen by a, a broader public. Um, and you know, they, they lived in a, I mean, like with that family in particular, um, yes, um, some future members such as Beatrice de Camondo did convert, but for pretty much every generation before her, um, there was the attempt to maintain a distinctly uh, Jewish family. There was sort of religious instruction, et cetera, et cetera. So it's complicated. Um, and I, I'd love to hear what Edmund has to say about this, but- so fascinating. I mean, and, and, and as, as James points out, there was an oratory 
actually, it, you know, and, and when they inherit, he inherits the house, the oratory is sort of stripped and the, and the Judaica goes to, to, to both the synagogue and to the Musée du Cluny. I think it's generational. I think it's really interesting, generational. I mean, certainly um, I, I've looked at the Judaica in my own family, in the Afrusi family, and uh, it, particularly in, in, the, in the Austrian branch, my more direct branch, and uh, it's generational. So there is an oratory in the Palais of Russi and um, in the Ringstrasse, and that Judaica is given to the synagogues, both the synagogues in Vienna that they attended in around 1900. So it's a kind of almost exactly the same kind of thing, which is where you go, actually, I'm going to still go to synagogue. I'm still, you know, semi-observant, uh, but actually I'm not going to have this at home. And, and that's an interesting moment, I think, in, in this transition. Very interesting. Another question. Can you both talk about how reciprocity or lack thereof plays out in your books? Gift to the states with no gift in return, letters, letters written with no expectation of a response? Um. You know, we're, we're, both, we're both writing into silence, both of us, I think, in our own books, um, which is what, what, what acts of, um, you know, creative acts of, 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 um, of history or, or literature or whatever are. Um, so I'm very, very powerfully interested by this idea of gift giving, um, because I think that, that no gift is straightforward. Um, gifts, um, uh, are complicated things. I, I, I've written about this in the Hair with Amber Eyes. I was given this huge inheritance. I didn't ask for it. And it was, it, it was unbelievably complicated my life. It's taken over my life to try and work out what that gift was, the gift I inherited from my Jewish great uncle. In the same sense, you know, the gift of, of, of things to France by these four families um, um, are complicated. They, they, they are what I call sticky gifts. They, they're not, they, they, they uh, embed these families in France um, and France hasn't actually worked out what they've been given. Um, and, and I think my letters to Maurice Camondeau um, in some senses waiting for him to reply <laughs> um, are, are, are really trying to, to navigate that kind of silence, that stickiness about gift giving. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's, um, it's the case that these families left these collections to the state, you know, before the horrors of the war. But it's, it's also the case that their descendants during that whole nightmare did, in many cases, write to occupation authorities and refer to these major bequests as evidence of their commitment to the national project, to the, their rootedness in France, et cetera. And I'll just read you a few lines from one such letter. So the um, Beatrice de Camondo was married, again, as we mentioned earlier, all these families are essentially intermarried, right? So uh, Beatrice de Camondo's husband or ex-husband uh, by this time was Leon Reinach, the son of Theodore Reinach, our favorite polymath. Um, anyway, um, they had a, so the, the, the Camondo Museum is given to the state but then the two of them had a private collection of significant value um, uh, that they were trying to protect and get back. And Leon Reinach in 1941 writes a sort of series of heartbreaking letters to the authorities uh, referring to sort of his, his family on both sides, his father and his father-in-law, what they had done. And he says, you know, I believe I should include this protest, asking you to be good enough to forward it to the occupation authorities so that they may take note that my family and that of my wife, long established in France, have considerably enriched the artistic legacy of their adopted country. And they really believed that that would be enough, that that donation, that that contribution would count for something. And of course, it counted for nothing in the end. And that, um, that sort of I mean, the worst part of all of this, in a way, is that these were such profound statements and also very brave statements in their time, and they fell on deaf ears um, in, the, in, the, in the war, and it, it saved no one. There is several questions about the women of these families. So two or two of these questions. Are, what? Yeah, it's about genders. Yeah. I, I read also the question. <laughs> it's very interesting. 
because they're, they're in this cast, this set of characters, you have wonderful women uh, collectors. Uh, the women play a very important role uh, in, in the Jewish family. So I think it will be uh, definitely the audience is, is, would like both of you to discuss that if you can. Um, well, I mean, you know, we, we, there are an extraordinary array of, of, of very powerful women within, within these narratives. Um, there's Beatrice uh, Epoussi, um, yes. um, who is um, a non-parai in terms of collectors. She forges her own path. She, you may well know her extraordinary villa on, on, on the, in Cap Ferrat, this sort of mirage of pink um, 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 in her incredible gardens. And, she is someone who, who forges completely her own uh, path in terms of collecting. She's, she's, she talks to lots of different people, but actually her identity as a collector is very much uh, um, oppositional in some ways to, to, to the family traditions of collecting. That doesn't look like a Rothschild house to me. Um, you know, when, 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 when you first go there, it's really quite extraordinary. And similarly, I think, you know, you can find, um, there's no sense at all that uh, Beatrice uh, Camondo, uh, Reiner um, was a collector at all. I, I haven't found anything which indicates, um, she says, you know, basically she grows up in that museum and, and I don't think, I think she, she escapes that um, identity of being a collector. Um, but, but of course there is um, Louise uh, kind of there, um, um, who amongst many other relationships is the mistress of my great great uncle Charlotte Frissy. Um, and, and she, absolutely, um, is a patron of the arts, an extraordinary um, uh, commissioner of portraits, um, and, um, you know, um, and, and has this uh, um, 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 effect on, on, on the houses that she lives in, the, the estate she buys, the art she collects. She's a remarkable person, and, and, and I wouldn't mind having dinner with her, actually, as well, James. I mean, she's extraordinarily powerful, interesting, a woman of, of enormous agency in the world. Um, there are more, aren't there, Yeah, I, I, there, there, there absolutely are. But I think it's also, you know, it's important to think as well. Um, so you mentioned Beatrice Epoussi, who I also have in my book as a, as a big character because I was exactly interested in the same thing. I thought that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's essential to examine a woman in the milieu as a collector and what she was doing and how that differed from her male peers. Um, but I think also just to take a step back for a second, um, it's really, really important to remember that so much of this uh, material obsession in the uh, in this sort of milieu, Jewish and non-Jewish alike at the time, it is a world of men. And the control of objects is in a way a mirror for the control that these collectors, and they were mostly men, sought to impose on their families and their wives and their daughters. And, you know, I have a whole chapter in where I try to get into the question of portraiture and how, um, you know, many of the wives, including Louise Candonver and her daughter, Irene, her other daughters, Alice and uh, Elizabeth Candonver, painted by Renoir, very beautiful canvases. You know, these portraits capture something of the perfect, you know, bourgeois wife and daughter, don't they? And every, I mean, pretty much every family in the milieu has some version of that. And what's so interesting is that in real life, um, all of these women, I mean, to use um, the, 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 the phrase of a, of a great historian, uh, Deborah Silverman, they act up against the sort of mores of these, of, of the moment they live in. So you mentioned that, you know, Louise Candonver, not only was she a powerful uh, presence in the world of culture, you know, she had this affair, she, she had relationships as a writer herself and as a sort of impresario with the kind of key figures in Parisian cultural life of the time. Her daughter, Irene, at the age, a very young age, leaves Moïse de Camondeau, converts to Catholicism, marries somebody else. Her, um, her granddaughter also converts. I mean, there was a lot of rebellion in the women in this milieu at the same time as the men were trying to sort of uh, protect it from within and without. And I think that that's um, an important element to think back on. So for the women, I think in many cases, collections were 
they could be oppressive and they could be, there was something sort of gendered about the control of the object. And I found some archival materials that suggested that for some of the men, the pursuit of the objects was a kind of sexual conquest in a way, or it had some sort of connotation of that. And I think that it's a very complicated issue and there's a lot going on there, but there, there are those elements too. But I think there is for uh, maybe um, an interesting comparison to do. For me, they embodied almost the woman of 18th century women, very independent, very strong, some of them uh, that gained their independence also through the arts or through literature. And uh, any of the men's collect, uh, the, the women's actually lived uh, 18th century uh, enlightenment in a, in a way that I, I find quite striking, actually. Never, never underestimate what a salon means. I mean, it's so fascinating yeah. to That's run a salon, one of those extraordinary salons in Paris, you have to be at absolutely phenomenal and formidable intellectual presence um, and have an extraordinary reach into people's lives. So, you know, that's a creative act. Um, it's, of, a, it's a creative <laughs> act. And at the same time, like in the 18th century, they were portrayed as this beautiful woman kind of object like Renoir later. And, but at the same time, they were also terribly uh, uh, independent intellectually and, and strong and, and had a, a very, very strong, important role, uh, I think, to play in, in that picture. Yes. So do you, it's nine o'clock in Paris. So it's almost the end of our conversation. Do we have a last question or do we close this conversation? Maybe Edmond to James, James to Edmond. Do you have a last question, a last word to each other? I mean, um... James, I'm going to go back and reread your book tonight. Um, I think it's absolutely fantastic. I really, um, I can't wait till our next conversation. But really, I think, I think at the heart of, of, of this fascinating conversation was a huge amount of, of, of circling back to something which is about unfinishedness. Um, uh, and I'd love you to reflect on that because for me, for me, this... The only reason I think I said my first line is this is unfinished business. <laughs> um, and I, I, I get the feeling reading your book that, 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 that that's congruent with your own sense of, of what has to happen next. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, that's a really, I don't know. I, I, first of all, I, I, I loved Letters to Camondo and I find it just so, the way you write is just unbelievably beautiful. So thank you again for this, this new book you've written. Um, on, that, on, that, on that note, you know, I think for me, um, it's, it's complicated because I think if, if there's some sort of, so what to all of this, you know, I mean, this is a question I ask myself all the time, you know, why are you, um, engaged in this foray and, uh, you know, into these very wealthy people who collected beautiful objects as the world collapsed around them. And what is this all about? And I think it's that, um, it's, it's the great what might have been that really animated me and that I think, you know, is, is part of the sort of unfinished business on my end. It's that, you know, we writing as we do now, um, you know, decades after the Holocaust, where there is no way to look at these people and not see what they cannot, what they could not have seen. Um, you know, it's that we owe it to them and to the people that they were to remember the world as they knew it and as they understood it, because, you know, the Holocaust was never inevitable. That's what makes it so uniquely horrific. You know, at every point, it was the sum total of decisions and horrible actions that might have been otherwise, but were not. And, you know, it's, um, you know, I, I, I think that um, I just, I'd like that, I'd like the people in the, in both of our books to be remembered as, as the people they were, and that, that we, we preserve something of their dreams and their ambitions and their views of the world because they were valid readings of the world. You know, it's not their fault that the story turned out in a way that they never could have imagined. And it also, you know, begs the question, who really ever understands their times anyway? I mean, do we understand ours? I certainly don't think so. But thank you, both of you, because I think your books are without any doubt will be and are very, very important contribution to our better understanding 
for um, of this past that we need to deal with and to to do better, better at remembering, better at sharing, better at 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 yes, understanding maybe, and uh, and communicating for sure um, uh, to to in France and and abroad. So um, thank you for 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 writing them. And, uh, and I wish you good night. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you so much, Jensen and Mund. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you very much, Steve.